is the Chief Executive Officer of Treasury Consulting LLP. And today we are going to speak about the topic which is balance sheet, sorry, banks, balance sheet management and what we are going to cover which is about immunization. But at onset, I would like to wish all of the subscribers and our investors, uh, our clients, the members, those who are associated with our brand, a very happy new year. We are shooting this video on 1st June 2018 and we are expecting to upload approximately 250 videos this year. So sitting today we are approximately closer to 500 videos, approximately closer to 500 videos and we are expecting by the time this year would end 2018 we are expecting at least 750 videos and uh, maybe probably 1000 videos by, 2000, no, by 2019. Anyways, the long distance to go and a lot of effort has been required in uh, that direction. So this time we are covering a very important topic from the bank's perspective. And if you're expecting that this topic will will is, go, is going to be hitting in the public sector banks of India, then the answer is completely incorrect. None of the public sector banks in India would have that problem. So this problem, this technique, immunization, theoretically is being used in all the banks of India. You name it, any public sector banks in India. But practically being implemented in the banks like Goldman Sachs, Credit Suisse, JP Morgan, Standard Chartered, HSBC and all. The reason being they are big bank. They are the, they are like take an example for Goldman Sachs. They are the bank, they are a bank who practically invented all derivative contracts. So it's being implemented there. Now before moving, let me talk a little bit about a bank. We understand bank very well. What exactly a bank do? A bank is a kind of organization who deals with the people's money. Yours money, my money or anybody's money. They are collating that money because that has been, there is a collateral there. We have a central bank who is taking care of our interest. There are regulators who are taking care of interest. Like in case of CRR, like in case of India you have CRR, like in you have SLR. Although SLR is not a kind of uh, security but CRR which is just 4%. So that money which bank is taking, that money bank is investing somewhere. So I am a person who is depositing, take an example, Treasury Consulting LLP is having a banking relationship with DBS India. Who is DBS? Development Bank of Singapore. So we are banking with the Indian concern of DBS Singapore. Now the money which we deposited in DBS India, of course the DBS India would be investing this money on overnight basis, that to in OIS, overnight index or, or must be they are lending some money. Right now, the point of the point of discussion here is that now DBS it's a relationship. Predom eighty percent of the relationship is in local currency. We are doing business in local currency. The EFC funding which we are getting, we are converting in Ayana. But what about the bank? Those who are global, Goldman Sachs, Credit Suisse, UBS, J.P. Morgan, Standard Chartered, and others. These global banks are practically dealing with almost every currency. You talk about Goldman Sachs, there is not a single currency, either it's a deliverable currency, it's a non-deliverable currency, it's a tradable currency, it's a non-tradable non currency, it's a thin currency or it's a non-thin currency. They have everything in the book. Now the moral of the story is, they have foreign currency asset and they have foreign currency liabilities in the book, which they have to manage. And nowadays, and especially after 2008, a huge amount of monetization has it happened by the central banks. I was looking at the BIS report. BIS stands for Bank for International Settlement. By looking at the report, I got to know that, I got to know that, you know, uh, approximately, uh, I think uh, I am mistaken, I might be wrong, roughly $600 trillion, uh, sorry, my mistake, 600 Japanese yen, uh, so yes, 600 trillion Japanese yen is the asset size of uh, Central Bank of Japan. And the liability side as per Bank for International Settlement was approximately a, uh, 1200 trillion dollar or something which is twice of that. Ultimately, the difference between both is almost 100%. When I see the US table, I got to know that they are having an asset side of approximately 4 trillion or something. And they have a liability side of approximately seven to seven and seven and a half trillion dollars. So ultimately the difference of three and a half. Now talk about central banks, talk about banks, talk about corporates. They need to maintain foreign currency asset, they need to maintain foreign currency liabilities. 
These foreign currency is set in foreign currency liabilities are further categorized as the short term interest, short long term interest, short term liability, long term liabilities, short term asset and long term asset. The moral of the story is the treasury department of a bank is doing something which very rare corporates in India are doing, which is immunization. They are managing their asset and liability in such a way that a change in an interest rate or the change in the duration of that asset and liability is not going to be impacting that corporate, bank, financial institution or anyone. But how are they doing it? The process is known as immunization. Unfortunately, if you look at the books, if you look at the Google, very rare books are talking about how exactly the immunization is happening. But if you talk about books, we talk about Google, 99.99% what sense we are making out is that what is immunization? Immunization is nothing risk sensitive asset minus risk sensitive liabilities. The difference is delta. Now it could be plus delta, it could be minus delta because it's bank to bank. In fact, if you take an example of Goldman Sachs, in the Goldman Sachs itself, you have a lot of uh, subsidiaries, Goldman US, Goldman Singapore, Goldman Denmark, and so on and so forth. They might be having different, different deltas. On a consolidated level, of course, Goldman should be having a positive delta, but we cannot confirm that. This is the theoretical definition of uh, immunization. When you will take a difference between risk sensitive asset minus you will take a, of a difference of risk sensitive liabilities and you compute this delta and the treasury department is taking a position on that delta. But practically speaking, this definition is not correct. And practically speaking, the world do not move like that. Practically, the world move in a very, very different way versus we have in the books and we very well understand that. Here we go. There are four techniques of immunization. And if you are thinking that uh, any bank is thematic in nature, by thematic I mean to say that they are completely dependent upon one technique, we are absolutely incorrect. The banks like Goldman Sachs, Standard Chartered, JP Morgan, UBS, Barclays, Citi, and Deutsche, Bank of America, HSBC, they have a huge risk sensitive asset. In fact, in trillions, they have a huge risk sensitive liabilities, in fact, in trillions. And they have categorized them not only in the multiple parts like long term liability, short term liability, long term interest rate, short term interest rate and so on and so forth. And further, these are the banks, those who are taking all the four positions and sometimes they change the positions also. It depends upon the market situation. We'll start the first position which we are talking is uh, I'm not saying obsolete. I'm saying it is primitive in nature. And as soon as we will reach here, we will go to the latest technique. Now the most primitive technique which we have is a repricing gap model. Now what a bank exactly do in a repricing gap model, bank will see that total interest which I am earning minus total interest which I am paying, the difference of delta is supposed to be managed. Now that interest which I'm talking about, that interest is nothing but the foreign currency. Please don't see FC, FC as a functional currency because in foreign exchange FC is being uh, denominated in two ways, functional currency and foreign currency. Now this, this foreign currency interest what they are earning minus this foreign currency interest which they are paying. Now you must be thinking a bank like JP Morgan, why they are doing it. Let me give you a very small example. JP Morgan, let's take two entities of uh, JP Morgan, JP Morgan London, JP Morgan US. JP Morgan, Morgan London would have a functional currency GBP. On the other hand, JP Morgan US would have functional currency US dollar. Now, uh, would have a functional currency US dollar. Now, JP Morgan, JP Morgan London, which have, let me write here, uh, let me write here, JP Morgan London would have a functional currency GBP and JP Morgan US would have a functional currency dollar. Now this dollar functional currency which uh, now assuming there are some GBP assets which we have in JP Morgan US and assuming which we have dollar liabilities which we have in JP Morgan London. Rather than taking a different approach, rather than computing the duration, I'm not saying that that duration is wrong. I don't want to comment it. I'm not saying that 
modified duration, macular duration, effective duration, these are wrong things. But the best technique to manage such kind of thing when you have a bank and we are you are practically working everywhere. Because banks like JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, they are practically working everywhere. Now, the best is that because once you console the books, you understand that JP Morgan London and JP Morgan US would continue to swap their position. And JP Morgan US would have a GBP asset while JP Morgan London would have a dollar liability. GBP asset would have GBP interest rate. On the other hand, JP Morgan London would have dollar, dollar liability payable side. The best part to manage that immunization is to keep the consolidation in the mind and make sure that you are going to follow the repricing gap model. You simply check with your subsidiary and simply think that boss, my subsidiary is that market, you know, uh, on consolidated uh, on consolidated level, this would be the position and this is how I, I, this is how I should be. Second is the maturity gap model. The difference between the maturity gap model and the repricing gap model is not much. It's more or less the same. But there is a little bit difference. The, the difference is that in this we have forgotten one thing or we have not mentioned in this which is the tenor. T-E-N-O-R which is the tenor, the actual tenure. Assuming the GBP asset in the books of JP Morgan US is for 15 years while the dollar liability is in the books of JP Morgan London is only for one year. In that sense, this repricing gap model might not work. We have to move to maturity gap model whereby I would be doing weighted average maturity interest earnings minus weighted average maturity interest payable total is delta and that delta is supposed to be hedged now we are going to do, we are going to be uh, deciding total number of weighted maturity like we are going to go for one year we are going to go for two years we are going to go for three years we are going to go for four years that we need to categorize if both the sides, the period is same, the bank is same, during consolidation you are able to make sense, go for the repricing. If both the sides, bank is same, consolidation is possible, but maturity is an issue because here the GBP asset is 15 here, while the dollar liability is only for one year. So there is a big difference, it's a maturity is so big, then please don't go for it, go for maturity, uh, go for maturity gap model. Third is very important and uh, of course third and fourth are my favorite. I always claim that duration gap model. Now in this duration gap model you need to understand one thing very carefully because 99.99% in fact I should have used 100% but I'm just taking a disclaimer 99.99% G7 group of seven banks are ex actually here leveraged duration gap model. Now why they are here and why they are not here, the reason being they are creating a huge leverage on their positions. Sometimes on the asset side and sometimes on the liability on the liability side. And sometimes we have seen that they are creating a leverage on both the side, asset side as well as the liability side. Moral of the story is this leverage is impacting the duration. Let's take a simple example. I am an American national, a Singaporean national living in Singapore which would soon be a reality and somewhere in 2018 and I deposit $100 with JP Morgan Singapore. JP Morgan Singapore created a securitization and they converted this $100 into $500 and they have started taking a position on this $500. Now the person who have actually invested $100 with JP, uh, with, uh, JP Morgan Singapore JP Morgan liability is $100, but JP Morgan took securitization and converted this into $500. Now that $500 is actually leveraged, so it is 5x. So the difference between duration gap model and the leverage duration gap model is the leverage. And if you are thinking that what is uh, predominantly the, the how much x is, is, is actually is it's 1x, 2x, 3x, 4x, there is not a right answer. The reason being you know, with maturity asset class, like you have which variety of asset class, you have variety of variety of liabilities, 
Now here you have different axes. You might have 1x, 2x, 3x, 4x, 5x, maybe more than that. Now in this, there are a lot of subjectivity which we have. In fact, I have a lot of subjectivity in this, in, in, in such kind of thing. Reason being, the most orthodox te technique is, is macular duration. Which I don't agree. I think the macular duration is something which is worthless. I think we should not go with macular duration. Then you have modified duration. I will simply disagree with that as well. I don't think that the modified duration is the right technique. Although there are a lot of books which talks about that modified duration is the right technique. Third is effective duration. I'm not saying it's not a right technique, it is a right technique, but the right technique effective duration is once the period is right. Example, it's going to be 100 basis point plus, it's going to be 100 basis point minus. I will go with effective duration at the rate FRA, forward date agreement. So I am going to be computing the effective duration at the rate FRA, forward rate agreement. The fourth and very important is key rate duration. which is shortly known as KRD and I always agree with that. I always think that KRD is something which is very very relevant nowadays. The reason being even if when the central banks are hiking the rate, they are winding up or tapering the quantitative easing or they are reinitiating the quantitative easing, they are actually focusing on a period. Like take an example, if you talk about Bank of Japan who was the first bank who moved from plus interest rate to minus interest rate. Now they are moving from minus interest rate to the power swaps. Now the first step which is the Bank of Japan is doing that boss, they wanted to have the short term instrument in positive. They are not expecting that 30 year bonds would be positive, would be at par. Because having positive is something they need to work out. They are expecting, not expecting 30 year would be at par. They are expecting that a short term would be at par. And this is what on which they are working on. And of course, the wonderful thing is uh, which I always value is convexity and I always value concavity. And I, in fact, a wonderful supporter of uh, this is effective convexity. I think that we are we right now in a stage when we have to go for a leverage duration gap model because we talk about G7 banks. They have a huge leverage positions. 2000 and again 2008 is the relevant example of that and this is still happening that is something it's a blessing of lord that is not yet being busted so overall these are the four important things which we have as far as the balance sheet management of the banks are concerned so the obsolete not obsolete uh, i should have used the word primitive the primitive is the repricing gap model maturity gap model duration gap model leverage duration gap model all banks are doing all four but as far as the G7 banks, since they have taken huge amount of leverage position and they have a huge uh, exposure in almost every currency, so they are predominantly here. This was what we wanted to present to you about the bank's balance sheet management. There are multiple videos which are on the card and of course, uh, not to repeat, but this year we are planning to have approximately 200 and tech, 250 technical videos and our target is to move approximately 750. In case you would like to have a training program on foreign exchange and derivatives, which anyways we are doing and not to mention you that our fixed income platform is round the corner and that fixed income platform is going to be changing a lot of things which are on the way. It's going to be something very constructive in the fixed income and something which is being dominated by G7 banks is now being dominated by Treasury Consulting LLP. You are most welcome. Uh, my mobile is very known to most of the people. 9899242978. While my email is rahul.magan at the rate treasuryconsulting.in. On the contrary, the fixed income platform number which we have is 91114019774. is an Indian code 114019774. And website is www.treasuryconsulting.in. Thank you very much. And have a wonderful time.